Our first, our first reading today is not actually a reading at all. It's a clip from a, a clip of video from a documentary um, which relates loosely to what I'm thinking about this morning, but it, it, felt, it felt compelling. So we get to watch, uh, watch a couple of minutes of uh, volcano activity this morning. It's pretty Im impressive. Um, <coughs> And we'll, uh, we'll, get the, we'll get a link added if you want to look that up later, too. That was pretty, um, pretty cool. So our, our Bible reading, the assigned lesson this morning, comes from the Gospel of Luke. It's near the end, it's one of those apocalyptic passages, which are, uh, sounds kind of freaky, um, and uh, involve a little bit of, I don't know, uh, spiritual jujitsu, we'll say. Uh, it's from Luke 21. When uh, you can set, set the scene, Jesus and his disciples near the temple or perhaps walking through the temple courtyard. When some of the disciples spoke about the temple being decorated with beautiful stones and the gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, that's really lovely. No. <laughs> Jesus said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left on top of another. Everything will be torn down. They asked him, Rabbi, when will this happen? What will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, beware that you're not led astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am the one. The time is near. Don't follow them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, don't be terrified. These things must take place first. The end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, empire against empire. There will be great earthquakes and famines and plagues in various places. And in the sky there will be frightening omens and great signs. He was known for his cheerfulness. <laughs> but before any of this, they will arrest you and persecute you, bringing you before synagogues and sending you to prison. You will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance. I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and siblings, by relatives and friends. They will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But not, a hair, not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. I don't know how to follow that up, so I'm going to talk about something here. I was in fourth grade, getting back to the inner child, I guess. I was in fourth grade. It was a warm spring day, made even better by the fact that my class was not in school, uh, which would have been an okay thing, too, because I loved school, nerd. <laughs> um, but we got to do something even more fun that day. We were on a field trip to Colonial Williamsburg. I don't remember everything that happened on that day what costumes and demonstrations we saw. I imagine there was someone churning butter and someone forging horseshoes and whatever. And uh, I don't remember what sordid parts of our nation's history were soft peddled uh, to a group of fourth graders. In fact, this story is so long in the past that I can't even reliably tell you that it was actually a fourth grade field trip to Colonial Williamsburg, but I've told the story that way enough times now that that's exactly what it was. What I can tell you is this, that at the end of the day, before we clambered back onto the school buses to go back to school and then be picked up, we stopped at an ice cream shop, and probably right there where we could, I don't know, right on the, the premises, I don't know. I was bus buddies with my best friend, Chris. Uh, we stood in the line together to get our ice cream cones. Um, I was a Rocky Road kind of kid. Uh, just uh, chocolate has always been my thing, and rich chocolate with pockets of marshmallows, even better. Add veins of caramel, even better yet. Rocky Road, I have to overlook the peanuts or whatever kind of nuts they put in. Those are unnecessary. They just are a distraction. Um, uh, but anyway, Chris got his ice cream. 
I got my cone of rocky road. We stepped outside the store and leaned ourselves up against the brick retaining wall to eat our treats before it was time to climb back onto the bus. The sun was shining, my mouth was watering, and I opened it up and brought close that good cone of chocolates and marshmallow and maybe caramel and unnecessary nuts. I stuck out my tongue for a good healthy lick and I rolled that scoop of ice cream right over the lip of the cone and watched helplessly as it dropped, as if in slow motion, no, and landed between my feet on the ground where it proceeded to melt and attract ants. And my friend Chris stood next to me eating his cone of ice cream, and I hated him with a perfect hatred. No, not, not really. <laughs> Um, you, you can imagine my distress, which is why I tell this story every semester when I teach my classes about Buddhism. Hang with me here this morning. It's an illustration of two related concepts, impermanence and suffering. In Buddhism, uh, these make up two of what are called the three marks of existence. The third is that there's no permanent and enduring self. I'm, not, I'm going to put that aside today. Um, impermanence and dukkha, the Sanskrit word, which is translated suffering or dissatisfaction. Um, the two are connected, not necessarily as cause and effect, but something close. When Buddhism diagnoses what it means to be alive, the starting point is that suffering exists. I think we can all probably feel the, feel the truth of that. Suffering exists. To be alive is to experience suffering and dissatisfaction. The second step in this diagnosis is to say that suffering or dissatisfaction has a cause. Impermanence is, is not the cause, but it's related. Impermanence really is, is just a fact not a particularly controversial one. Um, it's commonsensical, even just to observe. Um, <clears throat> things come into being from other things, and then they also dissipate. Flowers bud and bloom and then die. We're, we're used to these cycles. Trees bud and put out leaves that go from green to then oranges and yellows and reds and then brown, and then they fall off and become uh, compost and hummus on the, hum, not, hum, not hummus, humus, humus. <laughs> don't, don't, don't dip your pita in the, the leaf residue. Um, wind starts and stops. Erosion wears channels into rock. Impermanence is not the cause of suffering, but our desire to freeze things, to hold them to, in amber, to keep them from changing, that is one of the causes of suffering or dissatisfaction. The, the ice cream, the melting ice cream on the sidewalk, that was a minor trauma to a fourth grader. It felt more major, but really it was a minor trauma. Um, and it now exists as a funny story about impermanence. It's more palatable, even though my palate didn't get to experience much of it. Um, it or at least it's gentler than saying, we are but dust, and to dust we will return. Less jarring, say, than talking to your friends who are gripped in a moment of awe and telling them that the temple that they're gobsmacked by is one day going to be nothing but rubble. I don't mean to say that Jesus and the Buddha taught the exact same things. There are some fundamental differences, so there is some shared and overlapping wisdom. In the, in the later development of Zen Buddhism, there's a tradition of thought experiments called koans. Um, you've probably heard them before, like what is the sound of one hand clapping? I was always the smart aleck who went <laughs> yeah, It's pretty easy, right? Uh, um, or wind, I, I don't know. Um, but koans are questions or statements that are, are meant to be puzzling. They're meant to tie the mind in knots until it can break through to see that logical thought is, uh, is, is not all that there is. It's inadequate. Um, and breaking through that leads to enlightenment in, in Zen Buddhism. 
One of my favorites, mostly because it's a shocking con, is, uh, is the statement, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Really, right, it's shocking. Uh, and it's a paradox. The Buddha offered wisdom that led to enlightenment. But because he was, and therefore, he w would naturally be revered. But revering him uh, is a tendency to turn him into an idol, which becomes a barrier to enlightenment. So hence, reflect on this. If you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Oh, what do I do? <laughs> um, there's something deeply unsettling about Jesus pulling the rug out from under his disciples while they're in that moment of deep awe. Getting lost in wonder is a profound part of what it means to wake up spiritually. It awakens the spirit. It helps expand the sense of self beyond the, uh, one's own ego and narrow self-interest. Wonder connects us with the world beyond ourselves. So it's unsettling to see Jesus knock his disciples over while they're in the middle of such a moment. We love this temple. Isn't it so amazing? Yeah, it's just going to be rubble. And like, oh, well, what? I don't know what to do. Um, but it, it's powerful. In the middle of being bowled over by a human project, um, which is what the temple was for all its grandeur. In the middle of being astounded by that, to be shaken into seeing it dissolved is a strange kind of gift. It speaks of impermanence. In doing that, it also condenses eternity into a moment. You think about the stones and what it took to get them there, and think about the fact that they're not going to be there. You hold all of that in this one little moment. Consider that even the most solid things will dissolve. And what does that awaken in you? Wonder interrupted maybe by awe. The story itself is complicated. Uh, it speaks from a specific perspective. It, it was written down, the story as we read it these days, it was written down after the Romans had already destroyed Jerusalem. So what Jesus said in the story about the temple being uh, knocked over and turned to rubble had, uh, had already happened by the time anyone read it. Uh, so it holds a deep awareness that life is fragile. As the reading unfolds, it, it piles on piles on unsettling things, not just the destruction of the temple, but natural disasters, wars, humans behaving terribly towards other humans. As you read through it, you might start to notice that it's less a prediction and more a really uncomfortable description. The author Casey Overton writes, a curious revelation emerges that all these things can only apply to literally every moment of human existence. It's impossible to single out a single, uh, it's possible to single out a specific time frame of their co-occurrence. We are now globalized enough to know these signs are always happening. All of our days are doomsdays. How do you hold something like that? It's incredibly heavy. It's the, the rougher edge of this idea of impermanence. Everything is always and ever changing, always and ever unstable, and sometimes that is absolutely devastating. We can also see it on a much larger scale than human existence, which on the scale of time is little more than just an inhale. I, f I found our first reading after I went into a little bit of reading. <laughs> I went into a little bit of a, a YouTube wormhole uh, because I'd re I, read a, I read a review of a, a National Geographic documentary about two French volcanologists. Uh, a, a, a married couple met on a blind date, fell in love, and worked because they were both passionate about volcanoes and spent their lives uh, up close and personal with them. Um, as the video said, 
Oh, wait, where, where am I? Okay, uh, Katya and Maurice Kraft, that's the name of the couple. The, f the film about them is called Fire of Love. I've, n I've not seen it, so I... I but but um, the, uh, the reviewer considers their lives spent on the edges of volcanoes and, and writes this, which is what really sent me looking. They move as close as possible to the edges of the earth, looking deep into secrets that exceed human measurements of time. That's, that's interesting. You think of all the, the, the very creation of the world as bubbling up to the surface when you watch a volcano. Uh, to see the eruption is to see something timeless, to see the cycle of creation and destruction and recreation in action. As the video said in Sir David Attenborough's wonderful voice, um, that uh, volcanoes are certainly destructive. But without them, there would be no breathable atmosphere, oceans, land, or life. That was a pale imitation. I apologize to him. <laughs> Everything that gives us the solid conditions of our lives stands upon impermanence, on change, on flux and flow. Uh, coming back to human scale, I know I've rhapsodized before about the musician Nick Cave, uh, every time I quote him, I feel bound to say how uh, impressed I am that he tra has transformed from a young nihilistic punk to a rock and roll elder sage who is generous with his wisdom. The most recent uh, edition of his, uh, his email newsletter that he uses to just answer questions and respond to comments that people send to him. He, uh, he replies to a 23-year-old woman whose twin is dying of cancer, and she's wondering how to go on. And he relates that to the story of his own deep tragedy when his 15-year-old son, Arthur, died in a rock climbing accident several years ago. Um, in their grief, Nick Cave and his wife, Susie, uh, obviously grieved Arthur. and They were also worried about Arthur's twin brother, Earl. Uh, they got all so sorts of supports ready for him. When it came time for him to go back to school, Nick, Nick writes, he came into the kitchen and he said to us, whatever happens now is for Arthur. And he, he went on to do powerful things. So Cave offers that to this grieving young fan as encouragement. We are always in flux, always at least a little bit unmoored. We live in the midst of constant change. And sometimes that change is just loss. The stones of the temple come tumbling down. This is, this is what he writes to, to, to the fan. He says, it seems to me that our existence itself is kept aloft on an infinity of absences. All our lives are lived on the boundless tide of sorrow of those who have passed before. We lurch around the world in all our desperate and splendid humanity. And whether we realize it or not, our lived condition is forever saying, whatever happens now is for them. This is how we honor humanity itself, as the living testimony of those no longer with us. We who remain continue. Of course, the truth is that we won't continue forever, at least not as we are. The ice cream is going to melt. So what is, with all the doomsaying this morning in our reading and my sermon, this apocalyptic rhetoric from Jesus, uh, impermanence in its lighthearted and then its heavier form, did we come to, you probably didn't come to church for a downer, but I, that's running the risk of leaving you with that today. Uh, not exactly, I, I hope. <laughs> um, I want to notice the invitation and the challenge of all of this. Jesus named hard things, but also inevitable things. He also named that it's in the midst of them that we find ourselves that we gain our souls in his language. We stand with each other and we offer each other support and inside it all, we are held. And alongside the truth that everything is changing, that hard truth of impermanence, the equally real truth 
that something new is coming into being, always emerging. One of the other assigned readings for today is a passage from Isaiah that starts out by saying, with God saying, I'm about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. We're invited to create a world alongside God, to take what is broken and imagine something new into being, to take what was beautiful and let it re-emerge as the flowers and the leaves do every spring. With Nick Cave, we can look backward to those who've been lost and honor their humanity and ours by saying that whatever happens now is for them. But the, addip- the additional power of collapsing eternity into a moment is that we can also look forward. Our impermanence will give way to new generations. There will be people who we can only imagine, but it is our task to love them. It is our task to give them a world that is livable. It is our task to hold them preemptively in in this present moment, to consider them with care, to think whatever happens now is for them. By our endurance, we'll gain our souls, make it possible for them to gain theirs. And this is God's good news. Amen.